Okay, great. We got the recording going. Um, so tonight, what we're going to uh, go over is uh, diaphragm carburetors and ignition systems. And we're going to look at both of those in the still training area. We're going to spend a little time on that website. And I have lots of different carburetor designs here for you to look at. Um, these carburetors are a little bit, uh, little bit unique. Um, that one might look kind of weird to you, but maybe one like this, where it's got the primer bulb on it, looks a little more familiar like you would see on your string trimmer or chainsaw or something like that. Um, so this style carburetor, the principles work the same. It is a little different than what we've gone over. So we're gonna focus on that tonight. We're also gonna look at ignition systems and talk about spark plugs and heat ranges and some troubleshooting on that. And then we're gonna go back to governor systems and do some review on governor systems to prepare you for the governor's test. Um, so that, that, that'll be our, our main three topics. So with that being said, um, I'm gonna change away from this slide and we are going to open up the Still Votech website. So let me get a new screen share here. And there we go, we'll get the internet open and we'll close that out. Okay, so hopefully right now you can see the Still Votech website. Um, give me a nod or a thumbs up or something. I always like to make sure, beautiful, thank you. Um, so I know a lot of you guys, especially you, you, you folks that are with me tonight, you're my rock stars, you've been doing a lot of your, your online coursework. So I'm sure you have all seen this website, but for those who, who haven't, um, this is where uh, if you were a still service technician and you were gonna do training, you would go to this site. And it's not as extensive as what's on Briggs and Stratton, but it has gotten better over the years. Um, we're focusing on our class, the training areas that we're really focused on is six, seven, eight, and nine. However, for extra credit, you can do the other areas. And I do feel like, um, you know, especially if you're really focused on the outdoor power equipment, if you're, um, let's say you're a tree trimmer, well, the bar and chain one is really good if, if you're having to service and work on and maintain chainsaws. Um, but this is good information information. So last week I did an announcement where there's lots of opportunities that you can get extra credit. And so doing these ones that I've, I've highlighted here, um, you can get extra credit by doing those, those activities. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, what I'm going to focus on is actually this bronze eight area on carburation and then the magneto ignition operation uh, under bronze seven. So with that, I'm going to open up Bronze 8, and we'll go over some of this carburetor stuff. Um, let me restart this presentation, and I'm going to zoom out just a tad. Okay. Um, so jumping in, you can see that they have lots of these kind of unique looking carburetors um, on this slide right here. But as they say, you know, all the carburetors must comply to the same basic physical laws that make carburetors work, right? Their job is still to blend the air and fuel together into a combustible mixture so we can get this engine fired up. So even though they might look like this or they might look like that, they look different than all the other carburetors we've been looking at they're still going to have some of the same basic operating principles. So a couple just interesting um, factoids here, if you will. Um, atmospheric pressure, and I do like how they, they look, if you take all the air, like let's say you took a cubic foot of air and you stacked it all the way up to all the layers of the atmosphere, 
what you get at sea level is the pressure for you and and me here at the bottom. Here we are. Here's our stick figure here. Um, the the air pressure on on us is going to be 14.7 pounds square inch. How do we get there? From all this. Now that happens to be the same number for the stoichiometric air fuel mixture, and it's just purely a, co a coincidence. Remember that en engines running gasoline, they run really, really good with low emissions and good power and all that stuff with a 14.7 to one air fuel mixture. Um, if you were running a different fuel other than gasoline, let's say you're running E85 or propane or whatever, the stoichiometric mixture would be, would be different. So this is just a coincidence. So sea level, 14.7 PSI, how do we get that? Well, from all the air being stacked up on us. Um, 14.7 to one air fuel mixture for gasoline is ideal. Um, for most engines, remember our air-cooled small engines, we tend to run those a little bit on the richer side. We give them a little bit more fuel to help with cooling the engine. Um, so one thing I'll point out from this slide, probably wouldn't notice it on a lawnmower or an outdoor power equipment, but you'd probably notice in your, in your passenger car, if you were having to climb some big hills, like let's say you were going up uh, to Tahoe in your car here. Or maybe it's a pickup truck because it looks more like a pickup truck. Um, so you're going up the hill in your car. What you probably noticed is as you begin to go up the hill, it seems like your engine loses power. That's for two reasons. One, as you go up in elevation, the air is less dense, meaning there's less oxygen in the air. But two, as we go up, this atmospheric pressure here drops because we're going up in elevation. And so we have less pressure forcing air into the engine on the intake stroke. So we're filling the cylinders not as efficiently, and then we have less oxygen in the cylinders to burn. So it's kind of a double, double whammy, if you will. And that is why you lose power as you go up in elevation. All right. Um, in the racing world, a real famous race is the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. And recently, in the last couple of years, the top records for that hill climb race have gone to electric vehicles. Because if you're an electric vehicle, as long as you can maintain battery charge, your batteries and the electric motors, they don't care about what the elevation is. They don't care about the air density or atmospheric pressure. So you can have full power at the bottom of the hill and full power at the top of the hill. And that's why you're seeing these electric vehicles win these hill climb races like Pikes Peak. So anyway, interesting little side note there. Um, all right, so uh, moving right along, uh, the slides get into Bernoulli's principle um, we talked about this principle, a lot of times I'll call it the Venturi principle, but really it's after Bernoulli. And um, this is the one where we talked about um, an airplane wing and uh, they have some slides here, if I back up, where they have you blow underneath a piece of paper. And I feel like we, we beat you up pretty well with that for the last couple weeks. Um, this is one of those little tiny diaphragm carburetors. This, this image you see here is this carburetor cut, cut in half. And you can see that it does get smaller in the middle. And so that area where it gets smaller, that's the Venturi area. So remember that the airflow is going to speed up as it goes through the Venturi, and that's going to make a low pressure inside the center of the carburetor. Now, um, to try to try to explain that a little better and try to give you maybe a visual of this, I'm gonna turn on the document camera. I got my um, compressed air system hooked up here and um, got my water bottle here. And if I, um, 
I can get this to work correctly. See how they have a straw and they're blowing over the straw? Well, that's fine, but um, I want something with a little bit more, a uh, little bit more kick here. So if you look at my water bottle with the, with the straw, and we look at this picture of, of this carburetor, what you'll notice is that there's this main fuel discharge nozzle. And remember, that goes to an emulsion tube, which goes down to the bottom of the carburetor. If we go down to the bottom here, there is a jet here at the bottom, right? A restriction. And of course, this whole thing is full of fuel on this carburetor, that's the float bowl. Well, my drinking glass kind of represents the float bowl. The straw would represent your main jet and your emulsion tube. And the tip of this straw, the tip of this straw would be like the main discharge nozzle you see on the screen there. So I just need to get some air flowing over this. So I'm gonna change my screen share real quick. And we're going to go to just my regular screen for a minute. And I'm gonna go like that and like that. And we will open up the document camera. Okay. There we go. Oh, we had it. It's thinking about it. And there we go. I got all kinds of stuff for tonight from the manual to some ignition points, but I'm gonna go like that. And try to get my water bottle in there. Um, I can't see your faces, but I can see the chat. Uh, can you just tell me, can you see my water bottle okay on the straw? Can somebody reply on the chat, please? if you can see it. Yes, okay, beautiful. All right, so this air nozzle tip is gonna create my airflow. Hey, just a safety thing, never put a rubber tipped air nozzle up to your skin. Um, you could force air in your bloodstream, bad news. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take the air nozzle here and I'm gonna blow some air over what would be my main discharge nozzle. Let me move that back a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. Pretty cool, right? You can see the, the air coming off of that thing and it's pulling the water up out of the cup um, and discharging it. Uh, I thought that would be a neat demonstration. Plus I wanted to cool off the, the garage here because it's like a hundred degrees in here. But um, anyways, you, you get the idea. The main metering system is the primary system you're on uh, the majority of the time. And um, that system uh, works by airflow creating a pressure drop. So let me get my, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And I'm going to set up a new screen share back to the presentation. Okay, so hey, the main metering system, it works, um, but it requires quite a bit of airflow in order to make it work. And that's why we have an idle circuit and, and transfer, transfer passages for the idle circuit and all that stuff. So, um, so I, I beat you up with main metering and all, all this stuff, but what, I didn't beat you up with very much is, let me, let me back up, is why these little carburetors look so, look so unique. So before we look at those pictures, let's just go back to this picture. These carburetors look really unique because they don't have a float bowl. Hey, there's no float bowl. And not only are, are you looking at a picture of a carburetor, this is not only a carburetor, 
but it's a carburetor and on the on uh, on one side if you will and it's a fuel pump on the other side so i'll say carb oh that's supposed to say carb and i'll just put fp for fuel pump so it's a carburetor and a fuel pump and it has no float bowl that's why it looks so weird all right um so with that being said, we'll get back to where we were because it kind of showed us what's going on inside that carburetor. Um, these carburetors are um, put mainly on engines that are considered to be, I'm going to highlight it here, all position operation engines meaning that these engines are expected to run at all kinds of angles, right? You'll see somebody, they're trimming the edges of their lawn and then they'll turn the trimmer on its side so that they can do a little bit of edging, right? If you're a tree trimmer, you might be hanging in the tree, pruning those tree limbs up at all kinds of crazy angles. So because of that, um, we need to make these engines run upside down and sideways and all, all types of crazy angles. So that's what they mean when they say, hey, it's an all position operation engine. That means it needs to have a carburetor that will work with all positions. Well, a regular carburetor with a float bowl, guess what? It doesn't work when it's upside down. It doesn't work when it's sideways. If you've ever ridden like a a motorcycle and you've fallen over, you might have noticed that fuel poured on the ground because it was leaking out of the float bowl vent. Okay, so a regular carburetor wouldn't work on a string trimmer, let's say, because once you turn it at more than about 50 degrees of angle, the float system would, would no longer function. So these engines have to be equipped with a carburetor that will work at all positions, namely a diaphragm type carburetor. And so if I look at my image here, what you'll notice is that I have a diaphragm over here and a diaphragm over here. I have two diaphragms on this carburetor. One diaphragm is the fuel pump. The other diaphragm takes the place of your float bowl and that's the metering system diaphragm. So we got a fuel pump and a metering diaphragm. So they call it a diaphragm carburetor. These carburetors, by the way, they do not like a lot of alcohol in the fuel. And they really get messed up when you leave like fuel in there and no fuel stabilizer. And a lot of times when you have a little engine like this that has one of these carburetors, it's not running right. You know, you can, you can almost slap a new carburetor on it and that will take care of your problems seven times out of ten maybe even eight times out of ten all right so let's look inside this carburetor um so what happens is if we look on the fuel pump diaphragm side what you'll see is that there's a gasket there's a gasket here, but then there's this fuel pump diaphragm. And it's got a couple of check valves in there. And uh, the main body area, like right here, is used. It pumps back and forth. And basically, pressure pulsations from the crankshaft are directed through little internal passages to the carburetor. And that gets the fuel pump diaphragm pumping back and forth. I can find. fuel pump diaphragm. There we go. So that gets this fuel pump diaphragm pumping back and forth. Okay. Um, also notice on this image here that there's a little backup fuel filter screen. I've seen it where your fuel filter clogs up. People replace the fuel filter. They don't change this screen. The screen gets all clogged up full of stuff and that keeps the engine from running correctly. Um, so half of this thing is this fuel pump 
assembly. And so let me give you a common issue when the fuel pump quits working. You have one of these carburetors and you can push the primer bulb, get fuel loaded in the carburetor, fire up the engine and it runs for a few seconds. And then it's like it dies out of fuel. You push it again, boom, it fires up and then whoa, 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 dies again. And I've seen people do that over and over. Heck, I've even done it myself in a vicious cycle of frustration. Well, what's happening is if I manually use the primer bulb, I can pump fuel up through the carburetor circuits and prime the carburetor. I start the engine and essentially it runs out of fuel, likely because the fuel pump mechanism inside the carburetor has, has died out. The diaphragm's sacked out, it's got a leak in it, or maybe this filter screen's clogged up, but it's, it's losing fuel internally. Okay. Um, when these things are about uh, anywhere from three to maybe six years old, so let's say three, four, five years old, that's when the diaphragm start to, to start to wear out under normal, like best operating conditions. So it's not out of the realm of possibilities for you to have a worn diaphragm causing your, your engine not to run right. All right, so that is this fuel pump side of things. So what I will um, highlight here is that you're gonna have a line over here connected to the engine. And this line connected to the engine, remember you have a piston inside the engine. And of course the piston's moving up and down. And so that's making pressure pulsations in the engine, those pressure pulsations are what move the diaphragm back and forth, right? Get it to pump fuel. Um, to keep you from having to pull it like a million times to get it started, that's why there's the primer bulb in there because it kind of draws the fuel up and, and loads all these carburetor circuits with fuel. So you should have less times of having to pull the rope and move the fuel pump diaphragm by those pulsations to get the engine started. Don't forget that there's this filter screen right here that can sometimes get clogged up. So the fuel, I guess I'll make the fuel blue colored. So here's my fuel. Fuel goes in, it gets moved through the carburetor from the fuel pump diaphragm. It's got to go through that internal little fuel filter screen and it gets over to the metering diaphragm and there it it encounters a needle and seat. This needle and seat is just like the needle and seat on a regular carburetor with a float bowl, just this has no float bowl. What it uses is this metering diaphragm down here, I'm highlighting in orange. The metering diaphragm balances atmospheric pressure, which I'm drawing as purple, because I'm running out of colors here. So it, it balances atmospheric pressure over here. And let's say that's our 14.7, right? Or we'll round that up to 15 pounds square inch. So it's balancing that pressure with the fuel pressure in, inside of it or the fuel inside of it and the tension of this spring. And so this spring tension is calibrated to basically act as like the, the, the fuel level inside our float bowl. So if the spring is stronger, it makes the engine run leaner. If the spring is weaker, it makes the engine run richer. Okay, so, um, so you have tension of a spring in the, in the diaphragm and atmospheric pressure, all those things work together to balance out so that this thing here acts as like your float bowl and this whole area on the inside then ends up getting full of fuel and this becomes my float bowl area. There's all kinds of fuel on the inside of this thing 
and that fuel is there and ready to go, ready to be delivered. As air flows into the engine, it draws fuel out of the main metering system. It could draw it out of the idle system if the engine's at lower speeds. And so the main metering and the idle circuits, those work the same as, as everything else we, we talked about previously. The difference is, is now we've eliminated the, the fuel in the float bowl and put that diaphragm in place. I got one last thing I want to um, point out. Let me clear some of these drawings. And I'll get to your questions here in just a second. Um, so I think we got diaphragm flexes up and down. Um, what I wanted to show you was this slide here because you can see some of the, some of the, the, the bits here. So here's my metering diaphragm and you can see that on the screen there. There's the needle. It goes um, up against the seat right there and uh, there's a little spring. I don't know if I've lost my spring here or not. Oh gosh, here it is. Um, there is a little tiny spring that the camera can't focus on, but that's taking the place of the, the float bowl. All right. Um, so the last thing I want to point out here is that you notice that there's two screws here. There's one on this side, and then there's one on the other side. Okay, well, this screw over here would be labeled L. This would be my low speed mixture screw. And this guy over here is usually labeled H for my high speed mixture screw. And if I hold up this carburetor to the screen, you can see, well, you can see two screws and you couldn't really see where it was stamped in the metal, but I actually labeled it with the Sharpie pen. I put an L there and I put an H over there. Let me show you this bigger one. This is off a go-kart engine. It's pretty cool. It's got L and H labeled. In fact, the low speed screw, I have this adjustment on. And so as you drove this, this, this go-kart around, you could actually, as you were driving it, adjust the low speed mixture by moving that screw. Um, so what I like about these carburetors is you can, you don't have to change jets or anything. You can adjust the air fuel mixture by turning the mixture screws. Um, but what do they do to you is, well, they put a darn cap on here and make it really hard to adjust the mixture screws. They, they purposely put things in, in, in the way to try to prevent the do-it-yourself or homeowner from adjusting their screws the wrong, the wrong way. What I would say is um, if you have a carburetor on your engine, you haven't messed with the screws, turn them in and count the number of turns till they're lightly seated, write that down, and then back it out to where it was before, and then maybe try opening it up just a half a turn or a quarter turn, and basically adjust them to where the engine kind of runs its best, and you, you're probably right at the, the perfect mixture. From there, you'd look at your spark plugs to figure out what your mixture is. All right, um, so you can adjust the mixture on these. You got your low speed and your high speed. I find that they're a lot of times a little bit lean from the factory and they seem to run better if I give them a little bit more fuel. That would be unscrewing the screws a little bit. Um, all right, so that's what's different about the diaphragm style carburetors. They have a fuel pump built in, they have oftentimes a primer bulb uh, built in, and that works the same way as a wet primer on, on a Briggs & Stratton. Um, they have uh, uh, a metering diaphragm instead of a, a float bowl. Um, but the way the Venturi works is the same, the way the choke works is the same. So there's a lot of similarities there. It still has to do the same job. It has to mix the right amount of air with the right amount of fuel. Okay, um, so you guys had some questions here. So um, uh, diaphragm carburetors or do all uh, small engines for two stroke. Um, I wouldn't say that all 
two-stroke small engines use diaphragm carburetors. If you peek over my shoulder here, I have a whole bunch of engines on these um, shelves behind me. And a lot of those are go-kart engines, and we use a lot of two-stroke stuff in go-karts. And the majority of those do not use a diaphragm-style carburetor. Um, however, in handheld outdoor power equipment that we got to operate at any crazy angle, it is um, really, you know, a diaphragm carburetor almost becomes a necessity in that type of situation. Um, there are some new two-stroke engines. I actually worked on a, a still concre uh, concrete saw and I worked on a chainsaw that were both made by steel and they were electronically fuel injected. So that would operate at any crazy angle and not have issues. Um, you actually hooked up a laptop and everything up to the chainsaw, it was kind of crazy. But um, So no, not everything um, uses the diaphragm carburetor, but most of your handheld stuff does. What's the difference between a needle and a jet? Remember a jet is a fixed orifice um, that's not adjustable unless you take the jet out and you replace it with a different jet. Whereas a needle moves back and forth to a seat and it is adjustable. So a lot of your older four cycle carburetors used needles so you could adjust the air fuel mixture and they moved away from that. Your two stroke stuff still tends to use needles. Um, what I like about needles is I don't have to take the carburetor apart to adjust the mixture. Um, if, I, if I had a, a carburetor that ran uh, needles and I you know, moved up to Tahoe or something, I could just quarter turn to the needle and I, my air fuel mixture would be adjusted correctly. Uh, versus taking the carburetor apart and get, buying other jets and screwing those jets in. Okay. Um, is the low screw the same as the idle needle? It's, it's very, very similar. For, for all intents and purposes, you could say, yeah, it's the same. The one thing I will say that's different is that it tends to, to pull fuel from the low speed circuit, even under main metering. Like if I look at the picture here, one thing you'll notice is that, yeah, it's pulling fuel from the main metering, but it's also pulling fuel from the idle circuits and stuff as well. So what I find is the low adjustment, yeah, it does affect your low speed mixture, but it also affects the high speed quite a bit, more so than a carburetor that uses jets. So it's probably a little bit more appropriate that we call it low speed than idle, but it, it, is, it is essentially uh, the, same, the same thing. Uh, good questions, good questions. All right. Um, any more diaphragm carburetor questions. Um, this slide shows you the limiter caps that they put over those, those mixture screws to try to keep you from adjusting them. Sometimes they have some weird adjustment screws that you can't get. Uh, you need to buy a special tool to get on there. Um, uh, sometimes you can like hollow out a big pin and stick it on there and get that to grab it. Um, but this, this does a better job than maybe I did with, this is a fixed metering jet. If I wanted to change the, the orifice side, I, I would actually have to change the jet. Um, where with these, I can pop off the caps and turn the needles and adjust my air fuel mixture. All right, with that, I'm going to clear those drawings out of there. I'm going to exit out of this presentation. And um, we're gonna go back to the bronze training but we're gonna jump into some ignition system stuff. So um, what's important to point out on this particular slide? I'm gonna highlight 15,000 volts. Why? Because I'm trying to get electricity to jump a spark plug gap. And to get electricity to jump this gap, it takes a lot of electrical pressure. Voltage is our measurement or our name for electrical pressure. So it takes a tremendous amount of voltage to get electricity to jump through the air. Um, so in our small engines, we have to take something that doesn't have a battery on it that has to basically produce its own electricity, boost that up to 15,000 volts to get it to fire the spark plug. So it's, it's pretty amazing 
when you start to think about what's, what's going on inside the engine. All right, um, so components. Most of these are what you would basically call a magneto ignition system. Think of magneto magnet. There's a, there's a, a magnet in your flywheel that interacts with this unit right here, which essentially is your ignition coil, and in some cases, even your ignition module. And, and between the flywheel and this is where the magic happens to get that electricity to jump the spark plug gap. So wiring wise and component wise, what do I have here? Well, I have my flywheel. It's got a magnet on it. So I'm gonna try to write north and south on that magnet. Here's my ignition coil. That's supposed to say coil. Uh, and I got some wires that go over here to a kill switch. So I have to have a switch to turn off the engine. I turn off the engine by killing the spark. That's what these wires are. They kill the spark. So if I hold up this one, here's my coil. Here's my spark plug wire that I can put my spark plug on. This wire here is my, my, my ignition kill. So if this wire touches the metal of the engine, it'll shut the engine off. Sometimes you'll have an engine that doesn't run and it's because this little wire has been pinched to the sheet metal of the engine or it's worn through. It's grounding out, we call that. That will kill the spark in any of these ignition systems. Okay. Um, so now you've seen the basic components it's going to start talking about a bunch of stuff about magnetic fields. Um, if you've ever played around with magnets, you understand, hey, there's, there's magnetic fields and there's magnetic lines of flux, right? And you can't see the magnetic fields normally, but you can sure see how they interact with ferrous materials or materials that can be magnetized. So stuff that can be magnetized would be steel, cast iron, right? Materials that cannot be magnetized would be like aluminum. So some metals are non-ferrous, they can't be magnetized, and other metals can be magnetized. Um, so inside your flywheel is going to be a magnet. And uh, it might not look like much, especially if, if the engine's been ran and the flywheel's dirty looking, you might not realize it, that it's there, but there's a magnet pressed into the flywheel. And if you put some little iron shavings on there, you could see some of these magnetic lines of flux on there. I don't recommend doing that because once they get stuck on there, it's hard to get them off. And it would kind of mess up the way the ignition system works too. So don't do what you see on the screen. I'm going to play this video. This is talking about electromagnetic induction. So a guy by the name of Michael Faraday, hundreds of years ago, figured out that, hey, if I mess around with magnets and magnetic fields, and I expose some wires to magnetic fields, if I expose wires to magnetic fields, I can create electricity. Likewise, if I, uh, if I pump electricity through a bunch of wires, I can create uh, magnetic fields through that as well. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that magnetism and electricity, they're linked together. And I can use magnetism to create electricity. I can also use electricity to create magnetism. So those things w work back and forth. So in the case of our ignition system, we're going to use um, magnetism in the flywheel to create electricity. Now, every time that flywheel magnet goes by the ignition coil, for a brief period of time, the magnetism is going to be induced into the iron core of the ignition coil. Now, why do we put these laminated cores? It actually strengthens the magnetic field, so I have more of a reaction. Instead of just having some wires laying there, if I put that core on there, it makes the whole process work more efficiently. So the flywheel's spinning around, it's got a magnet in it, and it's gonna get really, really close to the ignition coil. Super close, but not quite touch it. So maybe it's 
15 to maybe 30 thousandths difference distance between the two. Super close, not quite touching. Inside the ignition coil is a whole bunch of turns. It doesn't look like it, but inside here in the plastic or epoxy of this coil is a whole bunch of turns of wire. And there's two windings, as you can see on the screen. There is a primary winding, and then there's also a secondary one. Um, this is the primary, I should have kept the colors the same, I guess. So this is the primary winding. And this one over here is my secondary one. Well, what's, what's the deal with those two windings? Let me show you a different picture. Here, they're, um, they're actually drawn in an electrical schematic. And so you got your primary winding and your secondary winding. Now, one thing I will say is you see that there's more squiggly lines on the secondary than there is on the primary. The primary winding might have 100 to 200 turns of wire in it. The secondary winding is going to have 10,000 to 20,000 turns of wire. Oops. So I have a lot more wires in the secondary winding. All right, so with that, um, what's going to happen here? Well, I'm going to induce magnetism in the coil that magnetism is going to cut across those wires in the coil in the primary winding and that's going to induce electricity in those windings and then I'm going to boost that electricity up between the primary to the secondary so I'm going to step up the voltage and in fact this ignition coil is essentially like a step up transformer so if you um if, if you live where there's power poles on your street, they're not buried in the ground, but there's power poles out in front of your house or behind your house, and there's those boxes up on the power poles, those are transformers. But they're step-down transformers in that there's 40,000 volts running through the power lines. We step it down to 220 volts and then drop it down into your house where it gets split into 110-volt legs. So it's a step down. It drops the voltage. This guy steps the voltage up, it boosts it up, because there's more turns of wire on the secondary than there is on the primary, the voltage gets boosted up. Now, you don't get something for nothing. You can't just boost stuff and get, so you lose current, you lose amps, but you gain volts. And what we're after is a bunch of volts because we got to get electricity to, you guessed it, fire the spark plug. So with that, um, we're going to fire up uh, uh, an animation here, but we do need to talk about when do we fire the spark plug? We have to have everything timed out, ignition timing, if you will. We have to have everything timed out so that we fire the spark plug a little bit before top dead center of the compression stroke. And we measure our ignition timing in degrees before top dead center. So degrees before top dead center. Why don't we just fire the spark plug at top dead center? Well, it takes a certain amount of time to get the electricity to jump this gap. That happens pretty darn fast. But then it takes a little bit more time to get that little spark to ignite the air fuel mixture. But that still happens pretty fast it still then has to go all the way across the combustion chain, right? So that takes a little bit more time. Now you might be thinking that, hey, all these things happen pretty quickly. And they do, but think of how quickly this whole combustion process has to happen when the engine's running at 6,000 RPM. It's turning 6,000 revolutions per minute. Stuff has to happen pretty darn fast. And so the problem is if I wait till top dead center to fire the spark plug, I'll be running behind the curve. 
So I have to get this spark to go to the spark plug just a little bit before top dead center. Okay, so this chart is kind of confusing, but what you're looking at is the ignition timing advance curve for a still engine. So earlier in the class, I've kind of shared how like the still engines are kind of more high performance. They require a minimum of 89 octane uh, fuel the Briggs and Stratton engines are a little bit lower performance. Briggs and Stratton engines, for the most part, they just fire the ignition at, let's say, eight degrees before top dead center. And, that, and they're just fixed. That's just how it is. Doesn't care if it's turning 1,000 RPM or 3,000 RPM or 4,000 RPM. It's essentially going to be firing the ignition at the same point in time. Well, because the still two-stroke engines run at much higher levels of RPM, right? They might run 6,000, 7,000, maybe even 12 or 13,000 RPM. The time gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So they actually fire the spark plug sooner and sooner as the engine speed increases. And that's called ignition timing advance. So ignition timing advances, I'm going to fire the spark plug sooner in that I'm going to get the spark to the spark plug sooner as the engine speed increases. That actually takes some kind of fancy electronics built into the coil. So from a, um, from a performance standpoint, the still ignition coils are going to be higher, higher performance. Um, if you were to cut them apart, you would notice that, hey, there's a computer chip in there. Yeah, there's the primary and secondary windings, but there's a computer chip, there's capacitors, there's all kinds of stuff in there. In fact, if you went to buy a new one where a coil for a Briggs and Stratton engine might be 30 bucks, a coil for a still engine might be 100 to maybe 300 bucks. For a motorcycle, maybe even more because it's much more sophisticated and there's more electronics in there to make the timing advance at higher RPM. But by doing so, it makes the engine have more performance. Not only does it run cleaner, but it makes it a higher performance engine. Um, so that's why if you go to replace these, you're like, wow, that's really expensive. So let's see it in action. Now, obviously, this animation is grossly simplified. You just saw the electronic circuit board inside that coil, and there was all kinds of wizardry in that thing, right? But this is a CDI, or capacitive discharge ignition system. And so what that means is that as the magnet comes by, it's magnetic field induces a voltage in the primary windings that charges up the primary windings and then the electronics inside there actually open up the electrical circuit current flow. I'm going to hold up to my camera here. This is a little tiny set. Gosh, it's hard to, hard to even see. But this is a little tiny set of ignition points. And this is just like a little on off switch that opens and closes. That switch is represented right here. So what really happens is um, the magnet comes by, voltage starts to be induced in the primary windings and it's kind of flowing around. And then this little switch opens up the points would open up in an older engine. Engines in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and through the early 80s used points in them. Um, the points would physically open up, and when the points opened up, the magnetic field collapses across the primary and across the secondary windings. So when the magnetic field collapses,
really hard to get it at the right spot. Boom, got it. All right. So the magnetic field collapses. It collapses against the secondary windings. Now, if I think of each one of these uh, as its own little electrical circuit, think of this being an electrical circuit. So if this was like the battery, that would be the plus, and this would be the minus, and the electricity would flow around like that. Well, when that switch opens up, the field collapses, this becomes its own little electrical circuit. So there's your plus, your minus, and guess what? If I have enough voltage, the electricity will jump the gap of the spark plug and go to the other side to make a complete path here. And so that's how we get the electricity to jump the spark plug gap. It's trying to complete the path of both sides of the coil. So if I hold up this coil, my path goes from ground, this is bolted to the engine, so from the middle of the engine, out the secondary windings, out the spark plug wire, out, and this screws back into the middle of the engine, right? So that's my complete electrical path there. So it's when the points open up, or more precisely, when the transistor in the circuit board turns off, that the magnetic field collapses and the uh, electricity jumps the spark plug gap. So I know that's, that's a lot of stuff there. Fear not, we're gonna revisit this um, concept of electricity and ignition systems again next week as well. All right, so the long and short of it, if I get to this slide here, is that we're gonna use a magnet in the flywheel. And the magnetic field in the flywheel is gonna induce voltage in the coil and the coil's job is to fire the spark plug. So if I look at this diagnostic chart, you see it's pretty simple, right? Hey, the engine doesn't run. Check the on off switch, right? Check your spark plug, okay? Then they want you to test it with the spark tester. And if it has no spark, heck, it's either the flywheel gap's not correct, or a bad ignition coil, something like that. Disconnect the ground wire to make sure it's not grounding out the ignition, and if, it, if it, it's not doing that, then replace the coil. Um, anyways, pretty simple diagnostics on this system. There's not a whole lot to it on a simple small engine, because most everything, all the electronics of wizardry, is built into this guy. So as long as you got a good magnet in the flywheel, the wire's not grounded, you got a good spark plug, it's, it's, if it's a good plug, it's not grounded, you got a good, it's, it's gotta be the coil or the coil slash module assembly. All right, let me, let me back up just a tad and talk about spark plugs real quick. Spark plugs are specially designed to get the electricity to jump that gap, but it's not just jumping the gap in the air, it's actually jumping the gap under compression, right? A lot of you guys have done the compression check now, and you know that there might be anywhere from, let's say 50 to maybe 150 PSI. In fact, the more compression you have, the harder it is to get the electricity to jump the gap. So the spark plug's designed to insulate the electricity and to direct it to the spark plug gap. So we have our copper center electrode here, and then we got our ground electrode on the other side. And we're trying to get the electricity to jump this gap. Now, maybe you've heard of like platinum plugs and iridium plugs and all, it's all kinds of fancy spark plugs these days. If I coat the spark plug electrodes with special materials, in this case, let's say I have some purple platinum there, then that makes the spark plug last longer. It doesn't wear down so fast. It doesn't wear away as quickly as copper. If I have a double platinum spark plug, I'm gonna coat the positive or center electrode. I'm also gonna coat the ground electrode. Um, iridium, again, it's a different type of coating. Sometimes you'll hear them called resistor spark plugs. Well, inside the spark plug, there's actually a little resistor element on the inside. 
to reduce uh, radio frequency interference. These ribs and stuff are there to prevent the electricity from leaking out. Electricity is kind of a, a unique uh, animal. It's kind of like my kids. It takes the path of least resistance. If, if it can be lazy, it will. Um, and so we have to make sure that um, we have to make sure that the electricity goes and fires the spark plug and doesn't leak out. So if you've ever got your engine wet and it's not running right, it's probably because the spark is leaking out and it's not firing the, the spark plug. So you want these components to be clean, you want them to be dry. So the ribs and stuff and this porcelain insulator is all designed to try to keep the electricity moving through the center of the plug to the electrodes in the engine and not leaking out anywhere else. We have a gasket here. Remember that this seals up our combustion chamber so we don't want it leaking compression. So that's important. And there's some spark plugs that use a gasket. Some spark plugs have a tapered seat and they have no gasket, it just depends. Cars a lot of times will use a tapered seat. A lot of your small engines will use a gasket style spark plug. All right, so we kind of got the anatomy of the spark plug. What we need to talk now about is what about the numbers on the side of the spark plug and the heat ranges? Well, fortunately still, uh, they, they use my favorite NGK spark plugs. And I know these numbers by heart. So notice how you have five, six, and seven. Now, if I look at this spark plug, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. It's NGK, oops, it says B9ES. So five, six, seven, my spark plug's actually a, a nine. So I got an eight and I got a nine. So my spark plug's way colder. I grabbed another NGK spark plug. This one's a B7. So here it is here. So what are we talking about hot versus cold? Well, we're talking about what temperature does the center electrode stay at? You can see the hotter plug, it's got a longer insulator on the inside. So it's kind of hard to tell from the outside. You have to like try to look inside of it and it's really hard to tell. So you got to use the numbers. The hotter the plug, the longer the insulator. The, the colder the plug, the shorter the insulator length is over here. So if I uh, draw my combustion down here, right? Heat goes into the spark plug from combustion. How does the spark plug cool down? Well, the heat actually has to transfer through the center electrode and then into the engine metal because the spark plug screwed into the engine, right? Well, it has to travel through more porcelain or more insulator and that doesn't conduct the heat very well. So the longer the center electrode insulator is, the hotter the spark plug. Well, why the heck would that matter? Well, if the spark plug is too cold, let's say I put this B9 spark plug I have on my weed eater, okay? This B9 came off of a, a motorcycle engine. This B7 came from a car engine. Um, let's see, what else do I have? I got, no, anyways. Um, let's say I'm running the B9 on my, on my, um, my lawnmower. I'm not asking a lot of work out of that lawnmower. And so what would happen is the spark plug would run too cold. And when it runs cold, carbon and stuff will stick to the spark plug and it will foul out, okay? So a too cold of a spark plug can end up looking like this one that I have here where it's all black. The spark plug's fouled out and it quits firing. Likewise, though, if I put, let's say, a B5 spark plug, a really hot plug, in my goat cart engine, I'm going to run it wide open throttle down the racetrack at 100 miles an hour, that's going to get so hot, it can melt a hole right in the piston. So I have to balance the heat range of the, in, uh, the, the spark plug with the performance level of the engine. Most of the time, my recommendation is this. Run the spark plug heat range that the manufacturer recommends, okay? Whatever the manufacturer says to run for a spark plug, that's what you, you run in the engine. If you start doing other crazy things, essentially you have become the engineer 
and now the engine could be running poorly because you did a bad job engineering the correct heat range of your spark plug, okay? So 99% of the time, my advice to you is run the manufacturer's recommended spark plug, okay? That's gonna save you a lot of headaches. Now, I always get the student, well, what if I hopped up my engine? What if I'm tuning it for performance? I've had students who are like, what? what if I'm running it on nitrous or something? Well, if you're making the engine more powerful, it's producing more heat of combustion. And in that case, as you get more heat from combustion, then you gotta have a colder spark plug. So if I were gonna run my engine on nitrous, I would put a colder heat ring spark plug on my engine, meaning that it would have a shorter insulator length inside there. Okay, so that's a little bit about spark plug heat ranges. To learn more about spark plug heat ranges, go to the you know spark plug uh, manufacturer's website. They'll usually have a whole bio thing. Back in the day, I would say, get a spark plug book and read the front, front section of the book. Nobody has books anymore, but anyways, um, on the websites, they'll tell you about what all those little digits in the spark plug, what do they mean? Okay, we're gonna wrap this up on um, looking at spark plugs. You can tell a lot how the engine's running by looking at the spark plugs. Um, actually, looking at the time, I guess, you know, I'm gonna tease you with that. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. I have all kinds of different spark plugs here, and we're gonna look at them with the document camera, and, and we'll, th that'll tell us, was the engine running rich? Was it running lean? Was it uh, burning oil? Was the spark plug heat range too cold? We can learn a lot how the engine was running by looking at the spark plug. This is almost like a removable window, inspection window, to our engine. So next week, spark plugs. What I have to talk the next few minutes about though, and I know I'm, I'm running out of time, is governors. So what I'm going to do is uh, close out this screen and go to the power channel. Um, I do see a question. Um, if the engine is, is running hot, use a cold plug. Um, if the engine is, it's, if not temperature of the whole engine, but the, the combustion temperature, I mean, if you do have a hot running engine, you could move to a colder plug, but there's probably other reasons why your engine would be running hot. So um, we'll continue more of that question uh, next week, okay? All right, um, so I have the Bridge and Stratton website up, or at least that's my goal. Um, can you guys tell me, do you see the Bridge and Stratton Power Portal up on your, up on your screens? Power Portal. Give me a thumbs up or a yes or a something. Do you see the Power Portal? Beautiful, okay. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to jump into the governor system test. Um, Cause there's one question on there that is pretty hard if you don't re know what the names of the parts are. Um, Hey, guess what? I know I don't see because they they pull a bunch of different questions. You don't always get that question. Um, hey, don't forget that there's uh, three types of governors, right? There's pneumatic governors, there's um, mechanical governors, and there's electric governors. I'm jumping in the governor's test again because I was looking for a particular question where it talks about the fly weights and all kinds of stuff and I'm I'm not getting it hmm most of the questions like on this one um, are pretty straightforward some of the stuff we talked about last week like remember last week I said hey on a governor system this spring <clears throat> is always trying to keep the engine at wide open throttle so um, What holds the throttle shaft in the idle position? Well, the spring's trying to go to wide open throttle, um, not a brass bushing, and a governed idle spring, again, is trying to open up the throttle. So the speed is sensing element. Remember the mechanics of the governor 
are trying to close the throttle, the spring is trying to make it rev up or to, to open the throttle, right? Remember to think of your governor system, it's like cruise control on your car, right? Well, I'm not seeing the um, question that I wanted, but I know the, what the question is. Um, I'm gonna go to just my screen here, and I'm gonna go to my document camera one last time. We'll clear all this stuff out of here because the question that you see on the Briggs and Stratton Power Portal basically asks you what's the position of the different parts. It talks about a governor cup, it talks about flyweights. So um, there's a gear. inside the engine and I'm trying to draw this gear. Um, there's a gear inside the engine and this gear is spun by usually the crankshaft, sometimes the camshaft, but this gear is spins when the engine spins. And attached to the spinning gear is a, a couple of flyweight mechanisms. So if I kind of cut this in half here and I draw a pivot point here, I have a couple of weights here. I'm going to draw it like that. And I'm going to draw it like that. And if I spin the gear faster and faster, that's going to cause these weights due to centrifugal force, it's going to cause the weights to fly out. These are my fly weights. So the more speed the engine has, the more speed this gear has, the faster it spins, the more the flyweights move out. Well, as those flyweights move out of here, as the flyweights move out, they actually mechanically are directed to a little governor pin and that has a little governor cup on it and that causes that part in the middle to push out. So as the flyweights move out, this part protrudes out of the center of the governor flyweight mechanism. Well, my drawing was pretty crude. I have the older Briggs and Stratton manual. Last week we went to the new manual and it actually didn't do the best job. They, they keep trying to make the manual lighter and smaller and they keep getting rid of some of my favorite pictures. So I got one of the old manuals here. And this um, old manual shows me some much better pictures of governor systems. and how to, how to adjust it. Now you might remember this picture from the PowerPoint presentation. Well, here we have it in the manual and it's right next to the static governor adjustment procedure. So it says here, loosen the screw you get a pen or something as a pointer. Loosen the screw holding the governor lever to the governor crank. So what's the governor lever and what's the governor crank? Well, what you have here is this long piece here is your, is your um, governor lever, okay? And this little pinch nut here going through there is your governor crank. So basically, you're loosening that nut number eight right there on the, on the picture. Let me see if I can focus that a little bit better. 
So you're loosening that little guy right there. Then it says rotate the throttle between idle the wide open throttle, note the direction. So you see what way all the stuff moves. And then it says place and hold the throttle pin link linkage at wide open throttle or high speed position. And you hold it there. And then you turn this little guy here, this governor crank, you turn it until it stops and you turn it in the direction that you noted before. You noted at the first step. So it starts labeling parts for us, like um, uh, noted in, in number seven here. Well, we're turning that guy right there. There's my governor crank. Here's the flyweights. There's the governor cup that goes in the center. And I'm trying to get these two parts right next to each other. So my picture that I've drawn is essentially this part right down here. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the governor crank pressed right up against that governor gear cup. I'm trying to get these two pieces right next to each other. I don't want these pieces to have a quarter inch play in there. So when I do the static adjustment, the engine is off, the engine's off. And so when the engine's off, these flyweights are fully retracted in. And that also means that the little governor cut, he's moved in all the way. So he's fully moved in, the flyweights are moved in, and then you're moving that governor crank piece, you're moving him into where he's um, pushed up against those components and you're taking out all the play. So I'm kind of disappointed I didn't see the question I wanted, but basically you want the, the engines off, the flyweights are retracted, the governor pin is all the way in and you're getting all those parts mechanically set up next to each other so the governor system will work correctly. So we'll try out one more time. I'm gonna close the document camera. And we're gonna we're gonna share the internet again. Let's see if I can just get it to reload. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm just gonna answer a bunch of questions here at random and see if it will give me a new test. Oh man, I didn't pass. All right, um, so I'm gonna go back to governors. Okay, hey, here we go. So, what is this part? Well, you can see here are my flyweights, right? Here, here are my flyweights. In fact, I will outline them. They're kind of shaped in a little L piece. So there's the pivot point right there. There's the pivot point. So those are my two flyweights. In the center here, I'll highlight it in blue. There's that governor gear cup. So as the engine spins faster and faster, the flyweights move out and that pin pushes out and that pin pushes the governor uh, crank on the inside. Well, this is my speed sensing element of my governor system, right? 
This one happens to be off a lawnmower engine. Remember those are vertical shaft engines and they use an oil slinger. So see how it has these weird little like paddles on it? Those paddles dip into the oil, grab some oil and throw it around. So not only is this guy the governor speed sensing element or the mechanics of the governor, but he also happens to be the oil slinger. So if I look at my, my answers here, oil slinger that lubricates the parts of the engine, yeah, it is. Speed sensing element, yep, it is. Um, so both of those would apply. Is it an oil pump? It's not really an oil pump, it's an oil slinger. So this is where um, these, these test questions are pretty tricky. You would think, well, you know, it does move oil around, it's an oil pump. No, nope. they are very syntax specific. It's not, it's not pumping oil through passages of the engine. It's not an oil pump. A timing device which keeps the camshaft and crankshaft in time. That sounds pretty good, right? But that is not what this is. So this guy, if I look at that picture, it's the oil slinger and it's the speed sensing element of the governor, right? So hopefully that makes sense. And actually that's a heck of a lot better than, than my uh, drawing was, right? But you get the idea how it, how it works. It's driven off the engine, so the faster the engine turns, the faster that guy turns, and the more the flyweights fly out. Now, speaking of flyweights, I bet some of you guys have heard the term balls out. My kid will do something on his skateboard or something, go, oh, I was balls out, right? Well, where does that term come from? Well, in the days of steam engine trains, they had a governor on them that had a couple of usually brass, but sometimes steel balls that would be attached to mechanics of the engine and they'd spin around. And you could actually see the mechanism on the side of the train. And when the train was operating at maximum speed, the two flyweights, the, these two balls would be flung out all the way, that means you were running that thing at maximum speed that you could run it out. So it's like wide open, balls out. It's, the, it's, a, it's a governor term. Um, all right. So um, let's see if I can find, uh, how about this one? What kind of adjustment should be performed if you've taken off the crankcase cover? I'm always gonna start with the static adjustment, right? Getting those pieces next together. Um, I still don't see the, the question I was looking for where it talks about like what parts next to what part, but now that you've seen the picture, hopefully that makes a lot more, more sense. Um, is that why they say brass balls? I think so. I think because a lot of those governor ball mechanisms that was in the chat, a, a, lot, of, a lot of times those were, were, were brass. So anyways. Um, so hopefully you're, you're feeling a little bit better about the governor system. Um, remember governors are like cruise control for your car, right? And they're going to automatically open up the throttle more as the engine bogs down but they're also going to close the throttle if the engine speed gets to be too great. There's a bunch of adjustments on governors. You always start with the static adjustment. But my other lesson here is nine times out of 10, when people think they have a governor problem, they really have a carburetor problem. The carburetor passages are plugged, the engine is running lean and that's causing it to hunt and surge around and then the governor is trying to compensate for a poorly running engine, so it makes it surge that much more. Okay, so the, the governor, there's always a little bit of delay on how, how it works. So if the carburetor is plugged up, the governor is really gonna have a hard time with things. Um, remember my tip is, if you manually control the throttle yourself, let's say you have an engine, it's hunting and surging, it's running weird, um, take your hand, here's, here's the fingers of my hand and arm, 
And I've been working out, so there's my muscles there. Uh, looking kind of disfigured, but anyways, so take your hand, grab the throttle linkage, hold the linkage steady so you take the governor out of control. You become what's in control of the throttle. If when you're controlling the throttle, the engine does run smooth, then yes, you do have a governor issue. But if you're holding the, the throttle stationary, mechanically yourself or by your hand or by some needle nose pliers and the engine's still surging all over the place, more than likely you have a carburetor problem, not a governor problem, right? That was my other uh, tip for you guys. Um, and then the last one is we'll finish up on the same picture. We saw it in the manual as they were going through the adjustment. This one's actually in color and the parts are labeled, right? So if I'm performing the static adjustment like we are in, the, in, in, this, um, in this drawing, what's going on? Well, first of all, the engine is off, right? Oops, two Fs, not two Os. The engine is off. That means the flyweights are fully retracted. They're in. That means the governor cup, he's pushed in, okay? That also means that this governor shaft is then you're getting it pressed up against that governor cup by turning the, um, the governor shaft, uh, it getting the slip inside the governor lever. Once you get all those parts next to each other, then you tighten up that little clamping nut and guess what? You've done the static adjustment. I would do the static adjustment, then I would do my governed idle, and then I would do my top no load speed. That would be the three steps I would go through to adjust my governor. I would say nine times out of 10, if you do the static adjustment correctly, the, and the carburetor was working properly, the, the other adjustments are, are in line. Very rarely do you have to go through and start, um, start bending tangs or move in spring positions and stuff. But every once in a while, you might have to do that. So, um, all right, any last, uh, any last questions for tonight? I, I think I've given you the tools that you need to, to ace that governor's test between last week and tonight and looking at my terrible drawings, but looking at the manual and stuff. We, we got diaphragm carburetors talked about. We talked a little bit about spark plugs. Remember, next week we'll continue on with ignition systems. We'll talk about how do you read the spark plugs to tell how the engine's running. And then we're gonna jump into small engine electrical systems. And then from there, we're moving into diagnostics. So, uh, uh, questions. Is the, sh the, um, is the shaft adjusted in? Well, Yes, the shaft is adjusted. The governor shaft, if I go back to this picture, trying to answer questions on the, on the chat, it says, hey, is the shaft adjusted in? If I look at this picture, yes, the governor uh, shaft is adjusted in against the governor uh, uh, cup there, right? What I want you to understand is that the way this particular one is drawn, I would turn this screwdriver head, I would turn him clockwise because that would move this guy clockwise and push him up against that governor gear cup, right? On other engines, I might actually have to turn it counterclockwise to do the same thing. That's why the instructions said, hey, look at the way the throttle works. What way does it move when you go from uh, closed throttle or wide open throttle. Okay, so if I do that, if I go, um, if I go closed throttle, there's, there's, my, there's my idle speed screw. So closed throttle would be here. And then this guy would go that way to go to um, wide open throttle. That would move this shaft this way, right? And if that shaft moved that way, it would make this guy turn clockwise. So if you see which way the throttle linkage moves as it goes from idle 
to wide open throttle and you look at the way the linkage works, you'll know what direction you need to turn that thing. And so on some engines, a lot of engines, it's gonna be clockwise, but on some other engines, it could be counterclockwise. So it's really up to you as the mechanic to look at how the mechanism works, which way does it function, and that tells you which way to do your static adjustment. Um, it makes more sense when you get a governor in front of you. And uh, so if you're still struggling with it next week, I'll get a, uh, an engine ripped apart and get a governor out. So any other questions? With that, we're a half hour over, so I'm gonna let you guys go. Remember that I have a discussions tab with technical questions you can post. Um, you can send me an email, um, you know, contact me throughout the week. I try to check my emails. If I don't get them every evening, I at least check them in the, the following morning. So every day I'm checking messages to make sure that I can answer your questions. Okay, with that, I'll let you get back to your normal lives. Uh, I, I hope you have some fun this week working on small engines and keep learning. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>